Hi, my name is Bryn Boslett, and I am an infectious disease doctor at the University of California, San Francisco. And today I'm going to be discussing the virulence factors and clinical presentations associated with group A strep infection within the group A streptococcal pharyngitis module. By the end of this module, you should be able to describe the virulence factors associated with group A streptococcus and compare and contrast the common separative, toxigenic, and immunological diseases associated with group A streptococcus infection. Group A strep is also known as streptococcus pyogenes. The word pion means pus in ancient Greek. Group A strep has a number of virulence factors that allow it to invade tissues, evade host defenses, and cause a number of separative, toxin-mediated, and immunologic processes. Let's discuss just a few of these factors in more detail. M protein and hyaluronate are two virulence factors associated with group A strep. The hyaluronate coating surrounds the bacterium for an additional layer of defense against phagocytes, while M protein contained within the fimbria on the surface of the cell act to bind complement control proteins, thereby preventing further immune activation and inhibiting phagocytosis. However, M protein is also antigenic, meaning that plasma cells generate antibodies against it, which later enhances phagocytosis. On a side note, there are certain M proteins that share common features with our own tissues, in some cases leading to autoantibody production and some of the immunologic consequences of group A strep infection. These will be discussed later in more detail. Group A strep also has a number of enzymes that are thought to play a role in tissue invasion. Some of these enzymes, such as hyaluronidase and kinase, are common amongst other bacteria as well. For example, Staph aureus possesses a hyaluronidase and a staphylokinase. These enzymes help to break down connective tissue barriers, allowing the bacteria to enter our tissues and sometimes our bloodstreams. Finally, group A strep possesses a number of toxins that are responsible for some of its pathologic effects. Streptolysins are enzymes responsible for the beta hemolysis activity of group A strep. They are released from the cell and act to lyse both red and white blood cells. Streptolysin O is one such streptolysin. It stands for oxygen labile. This enzyme is inactivated in the presence of oxygen. Streptolysin O is antigenic, meaning that plasma cells will form anti-streptolysin O antibodies against it. These antibody levels, called ASO titers, can be checked in patients whom you suspect had a recent strep infection, although this test is not commonly done. Another type of toxin that strep produces is the pyrogenic exotoxin, which is linked to several clinical manifestations of streptococcal disease. One of the exotoxins, previously known as erythrogenic toxin, was so named for its association with scarlet fever, a reaction which occurs when these toxins have disseminated in the blood. We can see an example in this picture. Some strains of group A strep produce pyrogenic exotoxins that act as super antigens. That is, they are capable of nonspecific mass activation of T cells. This can lead to an overwhelming inflammatory response known as strep toxic shock syndrome, resulting in circulatory collapse and death. Strep toxic shock syndrome typically occurs in conjunction with group A strep separative infections, which we will discuss now. We are all familiar with some of the separative conditions caused by group A strep, and most of us have experienced at least one of these infections in our past. Streptococcal pharyngitis, or strep throat in layman's terms, is group A strep infection of the tonsils and posterior pharynx. The infection is typically associated with throat pain, fever, and swollen lymph nodes. Strep can also infect all layers of our skin and soft tissues. The most superficial type of skin infection, called erysipelas, is pictured here. It involves the epidermis only and causes an erythematous, well-demarcated, painful rash. Cellulitis is a somewhat deeper infection involving both the dermis and the subcutaneous tissues. Necrotizing fasciitis 
is a more severe and rapidly progressive group A strep infection, which involves the connective tissues and the underlying fat with an associated toxin production that can lead to strep toxic shock syndrome in up to half of all cases and death if not urgently treated. It should be noted that these syndromes are not specific for streptococcus infection alone. Several types of bacteria can cause these entities, although group A strep is a common cause. Let's now discuss some of the toxigenic effects of group A strep. Scarlet fever is the name of the constellation of fever, pharyngitis, and diffuse erythematous rash that can be seen in some cases of group A strep infection. It is usually associated with pharyngitis, but it may also be associated with strep skin and soft tissue infection in some rare cases. One of the strep pyrogenic exotoxins is responsible for this phenomenon. This toxin is encoded by a bacteriophage that is acquired through lysogenic conversion, and not all strains of group A strep contain this toxin. Therefore, not all cases of group A strep pharyngitis will be associated with scarlet fever. The rough textured rash of scarlet fever typically begins on the face and the trunk and then spreads outward to the extremities, classically sparing the skin around the mouth as seen in this picture, leading to the finding of circumoral pallor. Strawberry tongue is another classic finding, also pictured here. Affected skin may desquamate, meaning to flake or peel off, after the acute infection has ended, typically around one to two weeks after the onset of illness. Although the rash may be pruritic, it is not typically painful and this manifestation of strep infection is benign overall. No special or additional treatment is required. A much more serious complication of group A strep infection is known as the streptococcal toxic shock syndrome. This is to distinguish it from other causes of toxic shock syndrome, notably Staph aureus. Strep toxic shock syndrome may occur with strep infection at any site, but most often occurs in association with infection of a cutaneous lesion, particularly with severe skin infections like necrotizing fasciitis. Signs of toxicity in a rapidly progressive clinical course are characteristic, and the case fatality rate may exceed 50%. Specifically, strep toxic shock syndrome is characterized by low blood pressure and evidence of end organ dysfunction, such as kidney or liver impairment, coagulopathy, or acute respiratory distress syndrome. Many patients also exhibit an erythematous rash, although this is somewhat less common than in staph toxic shock syndrome. Strep may be found in a sterile site, such as the blood, or it may be found in a non-sterile site, such as infected tissue. Let's now discuss some of the immunologic phenomenon caused by group A strep infection. Acute rheumatic fever is a systemic multi-organ inflammatory disorder that may occur after group A strep infection, specifically group A strep pharyngitis. The onset of systemic symptoms typically follows the acute pharyngitis by two to four weeks. Children ages five through 15 are most often affected. The exact mechanism of action remains a mystery, but the most widely accepted hypothesis is that anti-strep antibodies that are made to target strep M proteins instead bind to self-antigens located in connective tissues of many organs throughout the body. This causes a cross-reaction that has been compared to a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. Commonly affected tissues include the heart, nervous system, skin, and joints. This condition is now relatively rare in the U.S., affecting about 1 in 100,000 patients with group A strep pharyngitis. This is both because of a decrease in the prevalence of the rheumatologic strains of group A strep in the United States and because of the frequency of antibiotic use in this country. However, in developing countries, acute rheumatic fever remains common, and in fact, it is one of the most common causes of chronic heart disease, referred to as rheumatic heart disease in these countries. Rheumatic heart disease presents itself between 10 and 20 years after the initial group A strep infection. Here are a few more of the classic findings in acute rheumatic fever. Over half of all patients presenting with the disease 
will complain of joint pains, often starting in the wrists and ankles and later affecting the knees and elbows. Less commonly, subcutaneous nodules are found over bony prominences, and these are typically painless. You can see one example here near somebody's elbow. Patients may also complain of chest pain or shortness of breath. On exam, you might hear a pericardial friction rub or a new murmur. And if you could obtain a sample of myocardial tissue, you might see what is called an Ashoff body. These granulomatous nodules are found within all layers of the heart tissue in patients affected by rheumatic heart disease. They often contain multinucleated giant cells surrounding areas of fibrinoid necrosis, as seen here. Erythema marginatum describes the presence of non-tender, non-pruritic, erythematous rings, often present on the extensor surfaces and the trunk of affected patients. This finding is relatively rare, however, and is present in only about 5% of patients affected by rheumatic fever. Finally, one finding that is not pictured here is Sydenham's chorea, also referred to as St. Vitus dance. St. Vitus is the patron saint of dancers. This is characterized by rapid, purposeless movements, muscle weakness, and personality changes occurring in up to 30% of cases of acute rheumatic fever. It usually occurs several months later than the other findings mentioned and is postulated to be secondary to autoantibody effects on the basal ganglia in the brain. The diagnosis of acute rheumatic fever relies upon this constellation of signs and symptoms as well as laboratory findings, and a set of criteria were first proposed by Dr. T. Duckett-Jones in 1944, based on a case series of affected patients in the U.S. The Jones criteria have periodically been reviewed and revised by the American Heart Association and were last modified in 1992. Currently, the diagnosis of acute rheumatic fever requires at least two major Jones criteria or one major and two minor criteria listed here, plus evidence of recent group A strep infection by either bacterial culture data, rapid strep testing, or an elevated anti-strep antibody titer, such as an anti-streptolysin O antibody titer. Some experts feel that these criteria are too strict and may underestimate the true prevalence of acute rheumatic fever. Post-strep glomerular nephritis is another antibody-mediated condition that develops in patients who are infected by certain nephritic strains of group A strep. It is most common in the pediatric population. Unlike rheumatic fever, it can occur in the setting of either pharyngitis or skin infection, although it is more common following pharyngitis. Pathogenesis is also felt to be different from rheumatic fever, instead involving immune complex deposition in the glomerular tufts, although this is still somewhat debated. Onset of symptoms typically occurs one to two weeks after acute strep infection, and occurrence does not appear to be reduced by administration of antibiotics. Patients may complain of dark urine, sometimes described as tea-colored, due to hematuria or red blood cells in the urine. Other signs include edema and elevated blood pressure from fluid retention. If a urine sample is inspected, it is typically positive for both blood and protein. Happily, most patients recover normal renal function, although adults affected by this condition are slightly less likely to have a full recovery compared to children. Thank you so much for your attention.